differences between formulations. So the most important considerations to be successful with a BT in the field is timing and coverage. Now these two, these two uh, factors are important for other agrochemicals, but for BTs especially. And that's because uh, the commercial BTs must be eaten, um, uh, commercial BTs have a relatively short life on the leaf with uh, anywhere from three to five days of uh, peak activity uh, before they'll degrade in the environment. So timing that application uh, to the most susceptible uh, larval stages is critically important. Also coverage, as I mentioned before, commercial BTs are insoluble. So ensuring that all of the foliage is covered with those crystals and spores is critically important to success. And so encompassed within this, uh, these, these two concepts, is understanding when to apply and considerations for how to effectively apply uh, the products to ensure that uh, you'll get the most out of every BT application. And so to begin with, um, we'll start with a discussion on timing. So scouting and the decision to apply really starts with uh, going out into the field and um, assessing what's out there. And so I put here a link to the um, AC and Fall Armyworm Action Plan uh, uh, publication site, where there are a number of um, uh, a number of um, articles and um, and books about uh, that have details about scouting and how to make the decision to apply. For example, um, there's a really nice um, FAO and CAVI Fall Armyworm Field Handbook, where uh, the um, explanation or some some explanation of scouting starts on page 19. Uh, the Comprehensive Guide on Fall Armyworm Management using IPM uh, has a, a whole chapter on uh, going out into the field. And there's also a, um, uh, on the right-hand side, you have here a, um, a Cabian USAID uh, leaflet on where to look for damage, just sort of an easy primer on uh, where to look when you're out in the field uh, for the different larval instars. Uh, there's also a really nice publication on um, uh, uh, from the um, uh, African experience uh, that goes into uh, really a great deal of detail into a lot of the, uh, the aspects that I'll be talking about today. And so, uh, so, so using these tools is really a good place to start. We're not going to go into detail necessarily on specifically how to scout uh, the, the processes that, that you might take in your own particular fields or um, uh, that you might talk about with um, uh, with the uh, local applicators, um, but the tools that you need uh, are really uh, provided by the Fall Armor Room Action Plan, which is really nice. And why scouting is so important is that um, timing application towards early instars uh, ensures that you're targeting the most susceptible larval stages. So in this table here on the left-hand side, you'll see these are uh, first through fifth instars from top to bottom. Across the top, we have four different species of uh, caterpillar pests that are found in Brazil. Uh, these are the results of a, um, uh, a diet incorporated uh, feeding assay uh, conducted in uh, Mato Grosso State. This one was back in 2016, just used as an example. And here a commercial BT is applied at um, 400 to 600 grams per hectare. This is a, a dry flowable formulation. And the relative efficacy of um, uh, ability to control those pests is uh, here represented in colors. So green is anywhere from 95 to 100% mortality, and red means less than 70% efficacy. And if we start on the left-hand side, um, the uh, Chrysodexis includens is the, uh, the soybean looper. This particular species is highly susceptible to BTs. And even up until the fifth instar uh, with the higher rate, uh, it can be effectively controlled using a BT application. But if you look to the right-hand side, uh, the fall armyworm uh, uh, is only effectively controlled up until the third instar. The same goes for um, uh, Heliothis and even for Helicoverpa. So uh, commercial BTs in general are most effective against first and second instar larvae. This also goes for most agrochemicals, but for commercial BTs, it's especially the case. There are some exceptions, but with respect to fall armyworm, um, targeting early instars is really critically important to, uh, to ensuring that, um, that you can get the most out of a, a BT application. <coughs> Excuse me. Now, when making the decision to um, apply a BT, um, you'll be looking really at the economic threshold. Uh, 
So the pest presence alone is not always a trigger for treatments. Uh, economic threshold, uh, achieving the economic threshold or exceeding the economic threshold triggers an application to prevent yield losses at an economic injury level. So when using a BT, um, it's often best practice to use the strictest economic thresholds uh, so that you can effectively target the earliest instars where the BT can be most effective. And so uh, there are going to be a number of um, uh, these active uh, these action thresholds will uh, may vary by um, uh, may vary by region may vary by uh, crop developmental stages. For example, um, earlier developmental stages, uh, when the crop is very small, will have much uh, lower economic thresholds, uh, while later stages uh, can uh, can tolerate um, much more damage uh, before they um, uh, much more damage before uh, the pest needs to be controlled. And I think that what's important to keep in mind about these thresholds is that the the goal of these uh, uh, the goal of the models uh, that were developed on when to treat for fall armyworm are really meant to save you money and to save your efforts. Uh, to make an application of um, of any product um, earlier than is necessary um, simply means that you you may have to make those applications again later on. And so when, when considering these models, um, it's, it's important to keep in mind that they were specifically developed um, to give you the best level of control, uh, but also uh, ensure that you're not applying when you don't necessarily need to, to ensure that you get, you get the most out of your crop. So one thing, to look, uh, uh, one thing to look for when deciding on an application uh, is the, the number of larvae you might find in the field and the crop damage. <clears throat> But when it comes to a commercial BT, the best time to apply is as close to egg hatch as possible. Uh, the eggs uh, you might find in the field when you're looking will generally be found on the underside of leaves. Um, egg hatch actually occurs within about three to five days of laying. So timing that application um, within a week or so after, um, uh, after you find eggs can ensure that um, the first instar larvae are targeted. And depending on the impact of weather conditions on larval development and whatnot, a BT should be applied before that third instar stage. And so what this means is that, uh, is that really the goal of these predictive models is to time the application to, to get as close to egg hatch as possible, but to also account for the fact that, um, uh, that egg hatch doesn't always occur as uh, one you know, on the same day or or in the in the same time frame, and so um, allowing a certain level of damage and allowing um, a certain number of larvae to become present ensures that you have uh, the best window for application where you'll be able to target the most larvae possible. Um, a BT application applied uh, it, right after eggs are um, right after eggs are laid may not necessarily still be effective once those eggs hatch. So ensuring that um, that you're outside the window of egg hatch, but still before those larvae exceed uh, the, um, the developmental stages in which they can be most efficiently controlled uh, is really the goal of these, um, these application models. And so the number of larvae, um, the number of larvae identified per plant or uh, the number of uh, the percent of infested plants is most often used to time uh, applications. So scouting, uh, scouting pockets of plants uh, across the field in, in a, a prescribed pattern uh, will reveal either the number of larvae per plant uh, or the number of plants that are infested with uh, the number of plants that are infested with, uh, with larvae and give you an idea about the overall infestation level. So for example, uh, you may see economic injury, uh, uh, economic thresholds of uh, say, for example, 20% of infested plants. Uh, so for an early, uh, so for a um, uh, a corn crop in early developmental stages, uh, that that threshold may be twenty percent, while in later stages may increase to forty percent. Uh, you may also find thresholds uh, that reference the number of larvae. So for example, uh, if two larvae, on average, two larvae per plant are identified, that could trigger an application. Or finally. Um, uh, I've heard some recommendations around um, the level of infestation, that even if the level of infestation is relatively low, if it's uh, very consistent across, um, 
across a number of rows, then it could be indicative of a um, of a severe infestation, and could uh, uh, and could trigger an application in those cases too. So these are just a number of um, a number of tools that can be used to time the application, and the goal really is to ensure that we're targeting the most susceptible life stages. So uh, there are other. Uh, there are other indicators of the developmental stages uh, that can also help to determine uh, when a BT should be used and when it might not necessarily be the right tool. So for example, um, early in the infestation when larvae are still uh, in the early instars, you may see this kind of uh, windowing effect. Uh, you can see those white spots on the leaves. Uh, this is indicative of the uh, damage caused by early instars that can only really scrape off uh, the top layer of the uh, the leaf surface. Uh, now, the uh, the presence of frass uh, usually suggests that third instar uh, larvae or later are present on the plant, and on the right hand side, that severe level of damage is really indicative of uh, fourth and fifth instar larvae. And uh, why I wanted to point this out is that. Um, uh, that uh, the optimal time to apply a BT will be when you see this level of, of windowing, indicative of damage from uh, early instar larvae. Once you start to see the telltale signs of uh, later instars, like the presence of frass, or on the right-hand side, that severe level of damage, then it may become necessary to either include a um, another control option, so including another insecticide into the mix, or in the case of the severe damage you'll see on the right-hand side, if the populations are predominantly in the later instar stage, it, um, it may be best practice not to use a commercial BT at all. Um, as you saw in that, uh, that earlier table, those later instars are relatively um, they're relatively not susceptible to commercial BTs. And so more, um, uh, uh, maybe more acutely toxic um, uh, agrochemicals would be necessary in those particular cases. So you can gather from just a visual assessment as well uh, about when an application could be made. And there is in fact a, um, a model um, used to, to uh, determine that application timing, uh, what's often referred to as the Davis scale. Uh, so this scale is, um, <clears throat> The scale is established, uh, established the, establishes the infestation level based on either foliar damage or damage to the, um, to the ears of corn. And so you can see from left to right as uh, the level of severity of damage increases, um, so does the, uh, the Davis scale metric. And so by um, using the same kind of um, scouting tactics that you might use for uh, identifying the number of larvae and so forth, uh, you could also look at the average Davis scale. And for example, uh, you may use a trigger of maybe three on the Davis scale to determine when an application should be made. And this tool is, is really nice because it does give um, a broader visual assessment of the crop uh, to, to determine when a commercial BT could be used um, and especially for it to be um, most effective. And finally, some examples about um, when to about using those uh, using scouting to time uh, to to time the decision to make an application. So if uh, if the uh, if the scouting reveals that um, that the larval infestation, the level of damage, is below the economic threshold, then in these cases, it's best just not to treat. Uh, to continue scouting regularly, however, and to watch for other indicators of infestations. So even if you see the pest in the field, um, you can save money and wait. <clears throat> and I think it's, a, it's an important consideration to make because just because the pest is present doesn't necessarily mean that it needs to be controlled. Uh, there are levels of infestation that will cause um, the severe damage, and those are the levels that need to be treated for. So if the, uh, if the level of infestation is found to be above the economic threshold, then it's time to treat with a pesticide. If the population is predominantly early instars, then you could consider a standalone uh, BT application to effectively control uh, that initial population while also um, ensuring that you're not um, going to knock down uh, beneficial insect populations that can then naturally control um, further infestation. Now, if the population is mixed, uh, 
you may need to consider using a tank mix partner to control the uh, the later instars. Uh, in some cases, uh, commercial BTs have been known to um, uh, to have an additive effect uh, with other insecticides, and in some cases, even a synergistic effect uh, because they target completely different uh, sites from every other insecticide on the market. Now, if the population is predominantly later instars, a BT may not necessarily be the appropriate tool to use at that time. In those cases, you'll probably want to use something um, uh, a um, uh, something more acutely toxic to the later instars. And just as an example of this, um, I have on the right-hand side here, this is a video uh, that was taken out in our um, uh, the field that we used in, uh, in Thailand uh, to collect the footage. And here you can see the later instars are, um, uh, is, is already deep within the world. Uh, this, uh, this larvae is not likely to be effectively controlled using a commercial BT. However, uh, this much smaller larvae that's crawling out uh, in the middle here could be effectively controlled. Uh, using a commercial BT. And so for that reason, uh, in this situation, it might be, um, it might be best to include a, um, another, control, uh, another control measure in the, um, the application uh, regime. And so I'll pause here for a minute and uh, uh, take any, any questions. Yeah, thanks, Daniel. And, and the footage is fantastic. I love that last... Um that last frame that you just had there showing the two <laughs> in the stars uh, is uh, quite, uh, when I say fantastic, not good to see, of course, because, uh, but um, it's really, it is really nice to actually see both of them. And I guess that was one of the questions yeah. and you sort of just answered that around, what do you do when you've got different, um, I guess, stages? Um, and, and how do you take that into account? Any more tips on that and, and how you would manage that using BT? I mean, you gave, you gave a bit of an idea there around a mixed tank mix. What do you mean by that? What, what could be a, um, a tip or a, a little bit more clarity on that? Sure. So uh, Chris, Chris is online. Maybe he could, he could suggest what are the most common tank mixes. Uh, but this would be um, including um, other agrochemicals like... Um, uh, we've seen that uh, commercial BTs and um, diamide chemistries tend to work really well together. And so maybe when you have mixed larval stages like we saw there, um, including those two products in combination, so the, uh, the regular dose of both products, not necessarily cutting rates on either, but using uh, the labeled rates of each insecticide yeah. uh, can, can not only uh, control the insects themselves, it, it, they can also have an additive effect. Um, so uh, not only would we effectively control the, the young larval stages, but there'll be sort of an additive effect on the, uh, the later stages as well. We've, we've seen this um, in, in other insects too. Yeah, excellent. And uh, another question here was um, how to manage different thresholds when you have two or more species at the same time? Oh, well, that's an interesting question. I, I admit I don't have a, a good answer to that. Uh, Chris, are, are you on the line? Yeah, yeah, yes, uh, Daniel. Yeah, I tried to answer this question in the question and answer session, but still I'll add uh, something more here. Maybe, you know, in, 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 uh, in different, different species of uh, product, the, the Helicoverpa, you know, Heliotis or Helicoverpa, uh, the, the efficacy is good when it is applied when the larvae are in the young stage, the so first or second or third instar that we have seen in the in one of the slides shown by you. So yeah. that is uh, that is going to be critical now. So that is not a problem. Only thing is we have to see what is the ETL level, what, how many or how many larvae are uh, needed uh, uh, in that stage which warrants the chemical treatment. So that depends upon the species and de that depends on the crop as well. So as long as that is taken care of, probably there should not be any problem. That's what it is. Okay, thanks, Chris. Right. So which, whichever, whichever, whichever species exceeds that economic threshold will trigger exactly. the application. Yeah, exactly. Yes. Yes. Great. Yeah. Thank you. Um, here's another question here, just around that the Mato Grosso State publication is. It, oh, it, sorry, in that that location that you referred to, I think um, you had an example. Is there a publication about that work? Somebody's asking. 
I, you know, there, there, there might be. I'm not so, um, I'm not so familiar. I have this from a study that we had done with them specifically. Um, you can find, um, I, I mean, the the literature is really ripe with um, uh, with efficacy trials uh, across the board. I think last last time I showed an interesting um, an interesting study from Mexico where they were looking at um, variable susceptibility across different fields. Um, so there's really a, a great deal of interesting literature on, um, on larval susceptibility. Uh, I'm not so sure if there's a specific publication around, um, around that data specifically. Okay, excellent, but thanks, Daniel. And um, mm -hmm. uh, we've got quite a few questions in here. I'm gonna leave some of these to Chris because some of them are around um, economic thresholds, but also mm -hmm. what to mix with BT when you've got mixed larval instars. Um, and there's a few technical ones that I think Chris will be able to answer uh, and I'm sure he'll be busy. Um, there's a question here about is, um, is there a difference in the BT, I guess, reaction to BT or the response to BT um, between different strains of fall armyworm? So between the, the corn or maize strain and the rice strain, do, do, does that make a difference? Uh, so the question is, uh, is does, are these different strains have have different susceptibilities exact, to the BT? exactly yep it's it's distinctly possible um so the example i just gave about the fields in mexico showed that there was actually um a, some regional differences in susceptibility um oh, uh, commercial bts uh the 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 cry proteins in commercial bts bind to specific receptors uh in the in the caterpillar stomach and um I mean, just differences between uh, even uh, populations can mean different concentrations of those receptors. Um, this is how uh, resistance develops, is that eventually over time, uh, there's a selection for insects that just don't have those receptors anymore or have them changed. So uh, seeing uh, different levels of susceptibility between um, uh, even different variants within the same species is not uncommon. Um, we wouldn't necessarily expect to see like a dramatic uh, loss of efficacy uh, going from from one uh, one one type of armyworm to another. Uh, we would, I think, we would overall expect to see the same level of efficacy, but it would not be um, unexpected to see differences. Um, and that's uh, that's that, that's a big reason for um, adhering to uh, recommended label rates and things like that. Uh, because these uh, these rates are determined based off um, a myriad of efficacy trials that um, one would hope would cover the kind of variability that you might expect to see out in the field. Yeah. Yeah. So ensuring you know using um, appropriate application rates uh, would hopefully kind of level the playing field uh, even with differences between um, between the types of armyworms. Okay. Great, Daniel. Uh, does a pyrethroid have a negative impact on BT? Uh, no, not necessarily. Um, commercial BTs do work through ingestion. So the larvae, they do have to eat, uh, uh, eat the BT. Um, younger larvae that might be knocked down by the pyrethroids um, didn't necessarily need the BT anyway. So, um, so they actually work very well together. And it's probably the most common take fix partner with commercial BTs are uh, different types of pyrethroids. Yeah. And um, actually, there was a question before, um, Daniel, there's actually quite a few questions. <laughs> but another <laughs> one is, um, I, I mean, I really liked that p the, the picture you had there of the different the leaves across the Davis scale. I thought that was just great because you just don't often see that um, so nicely illustrated. So thank you for that. Um, somebody was asking about the use of uh, uh, pheromone traps, like whether whether that's a good um, good way, I guess, to ascertain when to use uh, a BT biopesticide. Would, would, what's your thoughts on that? Yeah, I think pheromone traps are really the, the way to go. Um, if, if they're accessible and they're, um, uh, and there are really well-developed models in a particular area, then using pheromone traps can help you time an application, um, regardless of, of, uh, you know, going out of the field and scouting on your own. Um, they can be such valuable tools to understand uh, what's coming into the field as opposed to looking for what's already there. Uh, 
Yeah. Uh, so pheromone traps will collect the adult stages, the moths. Uh, and so by counting the moths, we can uh, map out those populations and then determine um, the thresholds based off um, the presumed egg laying that's going on in the field. Mm -hmm. And so that way, based on peak moth flights, you can time your applications so that you get that earliest instar, that you time it as close as possible, and that you don't necessarily have to, um, uh, you don't necessarily have to, um, you know, hope that you don't have a lot of hot spots. Because uh, when scouting out in the field, um, you'll hope that you'll get a good, a good representation of what's out there. Um, but having a tool that collects a much, uh, a much larger area um, will give you a much better idea about what's out there. So I think whenever possible, using, um, using pheromone traps as one of your tools uh, is, is probably the best way to go. Excellent. Great. Uh, thank you so much. Um, I think we'll leave it there for now and, and carry on because I know there'll be more questions um, coming. I can already see more questions coming in. Um, but let's move on and, and see, find out a little bit more about what you've got to tell us. Okay, so uh, at this point, uh, it's presumed that we've decided that we're going to make an application of a commercial BT. And so now 